Hi, and welcome back to my channel, Learning Biology with Dr. Vanessa. In today's video, we're gonna take a look at an introduction to the nervous system. I'll talk to you about the overall functions of the nervous system, we'll talk about the divisions of the nervous system, and then we'll take a further look into what neurons look like. The nervous system is responsible for maintaining homeostasis. Remember, homeostasis is a concept that we talk about all throughout anatomy and physiology. It does maintain this homeostasis along with the endocrine system. So what you'll also notice as you go through all the different um, systems in the body, that a lot of them do work in conjunction with one another. And so the nervous system maintains this homeostasis and it integrates all body activities. So it's responsible for all behaviors, memories, and movements that we have within the body. All these actions of the nervous system can be grouped into three basic functions. They are the sensory function, the integrative function, and the motor function. Since the nervous system is responsible for all behaviors, memories, perceptions, and movements, it needs these three basic functions in order to be able to take signals from the body and send them back to the brain, and then from the brain back to the body. Let's take a look at these three basic functions one by one. The sensory function of the nervous system occurs through sensory receptors. This is where the neurons are able to detect changes with these sensory receptors. This can happen with external stimuli, such as your hand touching a hot stove, or internal stimuli, such as a change in blood pressure. These sensory um, receptors are attached to sensory neurons, which we also call afferent neurons. So the sensory function is going to detect some sort of change, whether this be an outside or external change or an inside internal change. This change is then going to be sent to the integrative portion of the nervous system. The purpose of the integrative portion is to analyze sensory info. It can actually store some aspects of this information and decide on appropriate behavior. This integrative function is the processing of that information. So it's taking that sensory information and then it's going to analyze it, decide on an appropriate behavior, and then send that signal out. This is all known as integration and it is done by interneurons. Once the sensory information is integrated, in the integrative portion of the nervous system, then if there is a um, motor response that is necessary for that, then it is going to move to the motor function. The motor function is responsible to initiate an action, motor action, and it's going to initiate an action in response to that stimuli. So it is going to, um, the motor neurons, which are also known as efferent neurons, are going to activate effectors. Effectors are things like muscles and glands. And these effectors can cause things like the muscles to contract or the glands to secrete in response to the sensory information. Let's take a look at an example of this so that we can put all three functions together and you can get in a, a better idea of how these work. I mentioned before the hot stove, touching that hot stove. So let's kind of just go with that example and I'll show you how these work together. So if you touch a hot stove, that external stimuli, that heat from that stove is going to cause your sensory, sensory receptors to be activated. It's going to sense that heat in your fingers, right? Your sensory receptors will be in your fingertips. You'll touch that hot stove. There will be an activation of those sensory receptors and the signal of that heat too hot will be sent to the integrative uh, portion. Those interneurons will take that signal they're gonna analyze that sensory information 
and decide on an appropriate behavior. What is the appropriate behavior? Obviously, you know right now thinking about this before I even say it, that if you touch a hot stove, your reaction is to pull back right away. So those integrative, those inner neurons are going to send the signal to motor neurons. Remember, motor neurons are going to initiate an action and they send a signal to effectors. In this case, the effectors are going to be the muscles that are going to contract. The signal is going to send, be sent from those motor neurons to those muscles. That's going to cause those muscles to contract. And when those muscles contract, your hand pulls back. Okay. So our effector is going to be the muscles um, that allow your hand to pull back. The signal is going to be sent from those motor neurons. Remember, those motor neurons are efferent neurons, and it's going to cause your hand to pull back. So we had a stimuli that was the heat that was sent to the sensory receptors, sent to the interneurons where there was integration, and the um, end result was that we need to take our hand away from the hot stove. So the motor output was sent to those um effectors, which were the muscles that allow your hand to contract and pull back away from the stove. Now, think about this. All of these processes happened very quickly in a quick loop, because if you think about ever having touched a hot stove or anything hot, your immediate reaction is to pull back right away. And so these signals are traveling incredibly fast in order for all this to be done so quickly, but this is how it's happening, okay? The sensory is sending to the integrated, and then there's going to be some sort of motor output. The nervous system is divided into the central nervous system, abbreviated as CNS, and the peripheral nervous system, which is abbreviated as PNS. The central nervous system consists of both the brain and the spinal cord. The brain itself is surrounded by the skull, the bone which protects the brain. The brain has about 100 billion neurons within it, all compacted into that tiny little space. There are cranial nerves that extend from the brain. The spinal cord is connected to the brain and contains about 100 million neurons. Extending from the spinal cord are spinal nerves. The function of the central nervous system is to process sensory information. It's also involved in thoughts, emotions, and memories, and it stimulates muscles to contract and glands to secrete. The peripheral nervous system includes all of the nervous system except for the brain and spinal cord. Like I just mentioned, the brain and spinal cord itself are part of the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system, however, is composed of nerves and ganglia. I mentioned before that both the brain and the spinal cord have nerves that come out of them. The brain has the cranial nerves, the spinal cord has the spinal nerves. These nerves are actually part of the peripheral nervous system. A nerve is a bundle of nerve fibers, which are axons, that are wrapped in fibrous connective tissue. A ganglion, which we find also in the peripheral nervous system, is a knot-like swelling where neuron cell bodies are concentrated. Sensory receptors, which we also talked about earlier, are also part of the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is divided into a somatic nervous system and an autonomic nervous system. There is also an enteric nervous system. This nervous system is the nervous system of the intestines. We talk about that nervous system a little bit more in the digestive system. Let's take a closer look at the difference between the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system has sensory neurons that convey the information to the central nervous system. This information is going to come from somatic receptors that are found in the head, body wall, and the limbs, and also from receptors for special senses such as vision, hearing, taste, and smell. The somatic nervous system 
also has motor neurons that are able to conduct impulses from the central nervous system to skeletal muscles only. Since motor responses can be consciously controlled, the action of this part of the peripheral nervous system is voluntary. The autonomic nervous system is going to consist of sensory neurons that convey information to the central nervous system from autonomic sensory receptors. These are located in visceral organs such as the stomach and the lungs. The autonomic nervous system also has motor neurons that conduct nerve impulses from the central nervous system to smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. Because the motor responses in this case are not normally under conscious control, the action of the autonomic nervous system is involuntary. The motor portion of the autonomic nervous system is going to be divided into two branches, the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. For the most part, these two divisions have opposing actions. The sympathetic division is referred to as our fight or flight division. It tends to arouse the body for action. So in this case, when the sympathetic division is turned on, it accelerates heart rate, uh, respiration, and it inhibits digestive and urinary systems. However, the parasympathetic division is referred to as our rest and digest division. This uh, division, when it is turned on, tends to have a calming effect. It slows the heart rate and breathing while it stimulates digestive and urinary systems. So you can see that for the most part, the effects of these two divisions do oppose each other. Let's talk a little bit more about a neuron. I've mentioned it before, um, but let's take a closer look at what it looks like, the different parts that it is composed of. Now, if we talk about nervous tissue, nervous tissue actually consists of two types of cells, neurons, which I just mentioned, and neuroglia. The neurons are really important because they're responsible for the processing networks that we find within the brain and spinal cord. And they're actually also connected to all the regions of the body and send those signals back to the brain and the spinal cord. So the neurons are most responsible for all the functions that the nervous system has. Now there are also other cells that we find within the nervous tissue, but I will talk about those in another video. Let's take a look at the structure of the neuron. The soma, or cell body, is the control center of the neuron. Within the soma, or cell body, we find cytoplasm. In here, we will see mitochondria, lysosomes, Golgi complex, numerous inclusions, and an extensive rough endoplasmic reticulum and cytoskeleton. Obviously, in this picture, you cannot see these intricate details, but these are very important to the operation of this cell. The cytoskeleton itself consists of dense mesh of microtubules and neurofibrils, which are bundles of actin filaments. And because there's so much rough ER, um, or rough endoplasmic reticulum within the cell body of the neuron, you can actually see this underneath the microscope. There are very dark staining bodies in the cell body. Again, you don't see it in this picture, but those dark staining bodies that you would see are referred to as nissel bodies. There are dendrites on the neuron. You see them; these extending from the cell body, and these vast branches um, are responsible for um, receiving the signal. These dendrites receive the signals from other neurons. The more dendrites that a neuron has, the more information it can receive and incorporate that into its decision making. You'll notice that there is also this long process that extends from the cell body. That is referred to as the axon. The axon comes out from one end and this thickened portion where it's coming from is referred to as the axon hillock. The axon is specialized for rapid conduction of nerve signals um, as they travel through. So the signal would be received from the dendrites 
and then it would pass through and down the axon. So the axon is very specialized in how it works, that it can rapidly send these signals down the axon. Each neuron only has one axon, and there are things um, referred to as Schwann cells, you see here, uh, artistically depicted, um, and the Schwann cells create this myelin sheath that enclose the axon. We'll talk about this in another video, but the idea of this Schwann cell um, encapsulating the axon in this myelin sheath, again, allows for this um, signal to be sent down much, much faster down the axon. And then at the end um, here, we have these little axon terminals. And at the axon terminal, we'll have a synaptic knob at the very end. And this is where it's going to create a junction with another cell. So it can um, create a junction with another neuron, or it can create a junction with like a muscle cell. And this is where the neurotransmitters are going to be released. There's going to be synaptic vesicles within these um, uh, synaptic knobs. There's going to be uh, uh, these uh, synaptic vesicles. They're going to be full of neurotransmitters, and they can release their content. What neurotransmitter they release depends on what neuron it is, what it is synapsing with, etc. This is a concept, again, we'll talk about in another video where we talk about action potentials. So we can talk about... Um, what a neuron would release in order for a muscle to contract or what a neuron could release in order to activate another neuron or even what a neuron could release to inhibit another neuron. So there are a variety of different neurotransmitters that can be released from different types of neurons. There is some variation in neuron structure depending on where that neuron is and what it does. Multipolar neurons have one um, axon and multiple dendrites. They are the most common type of neuron. They include most neurons in the brain and the spinal cord. Bipolar neurons have one axon and one dendrite. These um, are include olfactory cells, the retina, as well as the inner ear. Unipolar neurons include a single process that leads away from the cell body or the soma and then splits into dendrites and axons. We see these types of neurons as sensory neurons from the skin and the organs to the spinal cord. And finally, the anaxonic neuron has many dendrites, but no axon. These help in visual processes. The universal properties of neurons include excitability, or irritability, which is their ability to respond to environmental changes called stimuli. Another property is conductivity. Neurons respond to stimuli by producing electrical signals that are quickly conducted to other cells at distant locations. And finally, secretion. When an electrical signal reaches the end of a nerve fiber, a chemical neurotransmitter is then secreted that crosses the gap and stimulates the next cell, whether it be an organ or a neuron or a muscle. Thank you so much for watching my video. I really hope that it helped you to understand the nervous system a little bit better. Remember that this was only an introduction to the nervous system. I want you to think about this, get a better idea of the different components of the nervous system, what a neuron looks like, those cells that are going to conduct these signals back and forth, and later on I'm going to make some more videos that help you to even better understand the different aspects of the nervous system. If you like my video and the content of my channel, I ask that you subscribe and turn on notifications so that you never miss out on a new video. Also, if you like my content, please make sure that you like the videos, that you share my channel. I really hope to grow and keep bringing these videos to you to help you understand these different concepts. I want to be able to take something that's really difficult to understand in these topics of biology and anatomy and physiology and make them easy to understand so that you have that light bulb moment and that you really just understand how all these different processes work. They're pretty amazing, aren't they? Stay tuned and I'll be back for another video next week. Thank you.